Chapter Two: The Master Map Maker. Steam billowed behind me as I burst out the cafe door. It had rained the night before, and the sky still shimmered like a sardine's belly. Before heading up the street, I stopped to say good morning to the cafe owner's mother. She was in her usual spot on the side porch of the cafe, but instead of sitting in her chair, she stood leaning on her cane. Her wrinkled face turned out to the sea. "Good morning, Grandmother Noom," I said softly. She couldn't see any more, but the woman could hear like a fox. I put my hand over hers, touching the dark green lines of faded tattoos that snaked up her wrist and disappeared into her sleeve. Grandmother Noom had been a merchant sailor when she was younger. I like to imagine her as a pirate. "Can you smell the sea from here, Grandmother?" I asked. "I can always smell her," she said without turning her head to me. "Do you hear them?" "Hear what?" "The hammers ringing down in the harbor," she said in a hoarse whisper. I listened, but I couldn't make out anything over the sound of people talking in the cafe, greeting one another in the street. Grandmother turned her eyes to me, looking past my face. "They're ready in the boats," she whispered. "I can hear 'em hammering the copper to the hulls. We're going to war again." I patted her papery hand. I've only ever known her to be sharp as a tack. Maybe her age was finally catching up to her. I'm sorry. I have to go, or I'll be late. I helped her back to her chair and bowed, even though I knew she couldn't see it. I crossed the street and headed uphill toward the paper district. I turned onto Plumeria Lane, holding the porridge steady as I climbed the narrow stone steps. Up I went, past the bookshop, the paper maker, the calligrapher, the other bookshop, and the art dealer. All along the way, tidy shopkeepers in tidy aprons were busy sweeping the front steps of their stores. This had to be the cleanest street in the city of Anlong. The only thing allowed to litter the ground here were the pink and white blossoms of the plumeria trees that hung over the shop windows. In a place this serene, how could anyone believe we were going back to war? After two decades of fighting every neighbor in striking distance, the kingdom of Mankon was bigger and stronger than ever. We finally had peace. We had security. It meant I actually had a good job for once. At the top of the hill, the Temple of Nine Islands loomed over the street. The monks had come back from their morning walk by now, and they began ringing the temple bells deep and slow. I was still early for work, but my feet skipped every other step until I finally reached the shop. Over the front window, a cotton banner swayed gently in the morning breeze. The words painted on the cloth read "Pai Yun Wang Yai, Master Map Maker." I twisted my key in the front door and closed it softly behind me. As I slipped off my shoes, I breathed in deep. For a brief moment, the smell of the shop filled me up and erased my hunger. It was the smell of crisp new sheets of paper stacked by me, day-old ink mixed by me, freshly washed wood floors scrubbed by me, and tangy brass instruments polished by me. My heart beat a little faster as I pulled open the shades. This was my favorite part of the day. Golden sunlight spilled into the shop, illuminating the framed maps that covered the walls from floor to ceiling. Master Payun had been the master map maker of the Mankon Royal Navy for more than twenty years, the entire duration of the longest war. He had sailed all over the known world, charting more of it than anyone in Mankon. The sheer cliffs of the Hinder Range, the puzzle piece islands of the Padu Archipelago, the ice clogged shores of Wilna. And tiny, distant Machka. Payun was the last map maker of his kind still working in Anlong. He used old-fashioned map making techniques, drawing coastlines as intricate as a lace collar. This meant that he worked slowly, but in the end, each map was exquisite enough to hang in a museum. Some people in Anlong said that man would draw the pebbles on the beach if he had a pen fine enough. Others said. The spirits must have blessed him with a gift of far sight, and still others said in frightened whispers, "Stay away from that old Payun. Everyone knows he sold his soul to a demon in exchange for his map-making talent." I liked that one the best. 
The shop door creaked open behind me. I set down the breakfast porridge and bowed as the master map maker walked in. Blast it, Sai, you are always early. He scowled at me worse than if I had been late. His arms were full of papers and I rushed to help him before they all scattered to the floor. Windows, windows, he chided me. You keep this place too stuffy. Master Payun slipped off his jacket and tossed it to me. He shuffled, belly out, to the counter at the back of the shop while I cracked the windows. I heard him groan as he bent to reach the lower cabinets. Not exactly the image of someone who made bargains with demons. I still hadn't figured out how old Payun was, but his slow shuffle and his snow-white ponytail put him at least in his seventies. I joined him at the counter where he had poured the porridge into two ceramic bowls. He didn't thank me for getting it, just handed me my portion. I started to take a sip. No, no, Payun interrupted. You can't eat it like that. Here. He reached for the spicy vinegar and ladled two big scoops into my bowl. Now, eat. Yes, sir. I was used to his scolding by now, but when I first started my assistantship, I was sure I was about to be fired every five minutes. It had taken me all these months to realize that no matter how much Payun grumbled at me, my job was probably safe. Seven months ago, when the peace declaration was signed, Payun did what every shop owner in Anlong did, finally hired someone to help out. After so many years of having to go without, the whole city was in a rush to get back to normal business. I had been working for one of the shrimp stalls in the Gold Hope Harbor Market and had just dropped off a delivery on the other end of Plumeria Lane. As I passed Payun's shop, a teenage boy burst out the front door, his clothes covered with ink and his face full of terror. Payun chased the boy away, shouting that he had ruined two months of hard work with his sloppiness. Then the map maker had bellowed into the street. Doesn't anyone around here know how to use a blasted ink pen? I raised my hand. I was hired on the spot. Payun must have been desperate. Usually assistantships were arranged by family connections. If he hadn't been in such a hurry to hire someone, my job would have gone to one of those stuck-up kids I stood in line with at the cafe every morning. I knew how lucky I was, but I was still ready to bolt if Payun ever started asking too many questions. So far, he hadn't asked me any questions about my life at all. He always paid me on time, and even though he was as grumpy as an itchy old cat, he was never cruel. It was the best job I'd ever had. I raised the steaming bowl to my lips and took a slow sip. The porridge was mushroomy, oniony, and fishy, and yes, I had to admit that it was better with the spicy vinegar. If demons really did bargain for souls, I would have sold mine to eat that porridge every day. Master Payun slurped his portion down and wiped his fluffy mustache with his handkerchief before reaching into his waistcoat pocket. Too much work to do, never enough time to do it, he grumbled as he shuffled to his desk. He said this so often that I considered it his morning prayer. He brought out a polished gold disc and with a quick snap of his fingers flicked open the latch. He swiveled the lens out from its case, held it up to the light of the window, and began his morning ritual of cleaning it. The glass had a faint golden tint to it, and in the sunlight it glowed like a shard of amber. This was Payun's eyeglass, his most important tool. He used it to magnify the tiny pen strokes on his map paper, but it could also be used to see far into the distance. I'd always wanted to look through it, but I hadn't gotten up the courage to ask. Payun's lineal, a long chain of squarish gold links, ran from the eyeglass case to a clip on his waistcoat, a much more impressive way of wearing it than a dinky bracelet, in my opinion. I had never gotten close enough to count the links, but there had to be at least a dozen. Normally, he would launch right into giving me orders for the day, but this morning he stared out the window as he cleaned the eyeglass over and over. I grabbed my notebook and pencil and walked closer to his desk. Ahem, <clears throat> Master Payun, shall we go over the daily schedule? There was another delivery of boxes yesterday, but they're so light, I think they must be empty. Should I send them back? Hmm, what? Oh yes, just put them in the closet and I'll deal with them later. 
you still have to finish writing your lecture for the university. We have that order for the Kotang maps, and the naval secretary has asked if you could finish the new chart of Hinmak by September. One result of winning the war meant that all the conquered places got new names, which was a pretty good deal for someone in the map-making business. Payun curled his lip as if he'd gotten a whiff of bad fish. Hmm, <clears throat> waste of time. They'll just have to change the names back again after the next war. Um, yes, sir, and I guess you do have a lot of work on your list already. I tapped my pencil against my notebook. Maybe you should focus on writing that lecture, and I could work on making the copies of your map of Koh Tang. Master Payun suddenly swiveled to look at me. His eyes, which had stared blankly out the window a moment ago, were now focused very keenly on my face. Make copies of my map? Do you think you could? I had traced copies of other people's charts for him before. Simple things that were beneath the master's skills, like a chart of the fishing canal in Pristine Bay, or a road map of some backwater province. But even though I had been working for him for six months, I had never been trusted to recreate one of Payun's precious maps. I only thought, I was trying to help, sir. Payun stared at me the same way he had stared out the window, as if he were trying to see past the horizon. He picked up his pen and held it out to me. Show me. I looked down at the pen and then back at his face. He was acting so strangely. Was this some kind of test? The first rule of being an assistant is humility. An assistant must never boast that they can do the work of their master. I swallowed my pride and cast my eyes down at my shoes. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what I was thinking. Of course, that's far beyond my skills. Payun's bushy white eyebrows furrowed to meet in one line. He opened his mouth to speak, but before he could get out a word, our doorbell jingled. He shooed me toward the front. That's the post. I'm expecting something, Sai. Quickly, quickly, to the door. Relieved not to be in trouble, I hurried to the front of the shop. I swung open the door and nodded to the delivery girl before taking the mail from her. There was just one letter. I could tell from the thickness of the paper that it was from someone important. Master Payun sliced through the envelope with his penknife. I started clearing away our breakfast, keeping my eyes on his face as he read the letter to himself. As he scanned the paper, deep wrinkles set into his forehead. What does it say, sir? Payun looked up as if he'd forgotten I was there. What? Oh, nothing, nothing. Just an invitation to some frilly luncheon at the Naval Academy, that's all. He waved the letter back and forth as though it wasn't important, but the wrinkles in his forehead stayed put. He pointed to the counter behind me. Back to work with you, he said gruffly. We've both wasted enough of the morning. As I set to work washing out the inkwells from the day before, I snuck a glance at old Payune. He sat back in his chair, flicking the eyeglass in and out of its gold case, staring at the drawer where he had placed the envelope. That letter was no luncheon invitation. Payune might have been the master mapmaker, but when it came to lying, I was the expert.